Hello. Thank you for downloading us. It's another super download from your friends at Radio 2 here. It's your Confessions podcast, which will last you for the next half hour or so. Anyway, more bad stuff from the Radio 2 listener, all being judged by the Caring Collective, or not as the case may be. This week's concise collection features travel ticket trauma, phony fool tomfoolery, and slow stew stroppiness. Here it all comes. I had uh, three or four hours of confession reading this morning. Was it good? It was. It was. It was very entertaining. Though I just, just for the sake, just for, to help people <laughs> in the spirit, of, <laughs> in the spirit of that trail. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try and help you write a better piece. Mm-hmm. There are various heart sink phrases. Well, I, I always know we're in trouble. As you know, I have said this before. <laughs> when I was in the military. No, so me and my army mates <laughs> is one of them. Yeah. yeah. That's when we discovered the laxative chocolate. There that's another one. Okay. And also, that's when I joined up with my medical student friends. Okay. Ah. They, usually, <laughs> I might as well stop then. I mean, it, I'm not saying that it, it's necessarily going to be irredeemable, but chances are it will be. Yeah. Anyway, there's some good stuff that comes out as well. So here we go with uh, tonight's tale, which comes from Amanda. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda, for sending in this tale. Simon, I probably need to seek forgiveness for not only myself, but my son, too. This all started when my elderly mother, who's 80, who lives in Spain for the winter and then returns to the UK for the summer. It's late summer 2014 and she'd already booked her flight. Now, my mother is extremely prudent, doesn't waste money, loves a bargain. Consequently, she flies with an economic airline. So when she asked me to check her in online because she doesn't have or know how to work a computer, I agreed. When I went onto the airline's site, There appeared to be a problem, however, and I couldn't carry out the check-in. So my mother calls me numerous times, complaining and grumbling, and generally, I have to admit, starting to cheese me off. She has this disbelieving tone that is usually backed up with something like, well, maybe I'll just ask your sister then. So a little bit of family blackmail. So on said day, my son popped in for an impromptu visit. Whilst he was there, I was explaining the problem with the airline check-in for Granny, and how she was driving me nuts. So we decided to call her. He withheld his number and dialed with a very good Cockney accent. Oh, yes. I'm relieved to say he got through to her and it went as follows. So my son is called Christian, but he's pretending to be called James from the airline. So when I'm doing Cockney, I'm being the airline. And when it's the other voice, that's Granny. Okay, because we'll have a definite difference. This is going to be like radio radio drama. (laughs) Wow. This Great. is okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hi, this is James. Uh, good day. Is that Laura? <laughs> yes. I, I I understand you appear to be having problems checking into your flight to yeah. Spain. Yes, dear. My daughter has been trying, but I'm sure she's doing something wrong. <gasps> I was just about to call her sister. <laughs> Oh, no, no need. We're aware of the situation and uh, I can check you in myself. I just need to ask you a few questions. OK, dear, far away. Uh, Laura, can I call you Laura? Yes, you can. Are you in good health? Yes, dear. Are you afraid of heights? Um, <laughs> well, no, not really. It depends. Why, why do you ask? It's just procedure, Laura. Bear with me. <sighs> Laura, can I ask a personal question? Are you a large, medium or small? <laughs> what? It's, a ja- it's for a jacket, madam. Jacket? What are you asking me this for? Well, Laura, we only have two seats left on this plane and they're both in the middle of the plane by the emergency exit and due to the new rules, you have to wear a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> a parachute? Yes, I'm a- for the whole flight. I can't wear a parachute, I'm nearly 80. Now, Simon, at this stage, says Amanda, I have to tell you, I'm in bits. Purple in the face, and I thought I might have an accident any minute. Christian, in the meantime, remained completely cool. All right, Laura, I know it sounds strange, but we do take passenger safety very seriously. OK, I need to talk to my daughter. Can I call you back? Yeah, of course, that's fine. Speak to you soon. Oh, and you have to choose between tarpaulin or silk. <laughs> Well, it wasn't long before my mobile (laughs) rang. I can only describe my mother's tone as, well, hysterical. She doesn't normally swear, but in between the swear words, I heard seat, check, parachute, and I'm 80. Tarpaulin silk. We agreed she should call the airline and talk it through with the manager. She agreed and muttering, someone's going to get sacked for this. We left it to her to make the call. My only wish was that I could have been a fly on the wall 
of airline customer services. She called them and unravelled the tale of her conversation with James and was promptly put on hold. After a ten-minute wait, she hung up. She called me back and she said she was now extremely cross. I managed to check her in without a parachute and all was well. She has never flown with that airline ever since and tells anyone with a pulse the story over <laughs> and over again. So I need forgiveness from the airline for the loss of sales and reputation and ourselves for playing such a prank on the world's most annoying mother. All the phrases of uh, of Amanda uh, on that. What a relief, by the way, that the guy at the other end of the phone was a Londoner. Yes, imagine if Im- yeah. imagine if it was from somewhere else. Mm. Anyway, that's uh, that's a thing. Uh, Sister Bobby, what are you saying there? You can't do this to your granny. Look, she's gone down through generations. So, I'm. Uh, I understand if your granny was a bit of a practical joker, and you could tell her afterwards, and she would laugh at you and enjoy it. Then you can do this to your granny. But if she's not, then you know, just a little bit of respect. She was it's annoying. a bit mean. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing is, it's their right to because they've bought generations. Up, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely fine. You are not forgiven oh, for okay. winding up your granny. What do you say, Matthew? I think precisely the kind of people that you want to play practical jokes on are those that can't take it. So those is always <laughs> far more funny when they don't understand the joke. I, I, I've got a problem here with the, the budget airline who put her on hold. I mean, as soon as she rings up and says, I've been called by one of your colleagues, they told me I've got to wear a parachute... Obviously, you say, no, that's not the case. No one gets on the plane wearing a parachute. Why are they putting her on hold and then cancelling the phone down after 10 minutes? Absolutely disgraceful. So um, I am going to forgive just because this is an excellent story. I would, on the other hand, very much like to wear a parachute the next time I get on a plane. I think that would be enormous fun. So what do we have here? We have a, a drive time confession from Sue. You remember this one? We we labelled at the top of the show "Dances with Scousers." Okay. For reasons that you're about to discover. Dear Simon Mayo and the Confessional, my name is Sue. How do you do? I have a confession <laughs> uh, to make, which dates back 20 years when I had just been diagnosed with ME or yuppie flu, as it was known then. It forced me to retire from my beloved teaching job and I found myself struggling to deal with daily life. The worst thing about it, I found, was the mental confusion and lack of concentration. I was almost brain dead. I decided to try and address this by digging out an old essay from school days which had won me the Junior House Essay of the Year competition. I worked on the idea to write a book. It was a medieval romance, about 60,000 words, and when it was finished, I had the usual rejections from publishers, so I decided to do it myself. Ha, huh. well, self-publishing was not approved of back then, but my friend entered it into a writer's news competition, and, unbelievably, I won. £250 and a trip to London to be presented with the prize. Now, the win gave me some confidence, and I went on to write my next book, which is called Brave Heart. Two words. This was before the film of the similar name, but when the film did come out, I thought, hmm, this might interest someone like Kevin Costner, who was my idol at the time, what with Robin Hood and the bodyguard and so on. So I decided to phone him. <laughs> as, of course. As you yeah. would. Yeah. I really Shut like that up. person. I know I'm going to ring them up. Yeah, in the phone book, probably. I got the number for Warner Brothers. OK, now I have to say this is going to be another little bit of a drama situation here. I have to, I'm going to have to stretch my vocab because yes. there's no way I can... They're, they're not Cockneys it's in It's going to have to be Brothers. slightly American in places or an approximation. So when it's an ordinary voice, that's Sue. That's going to be you. And when it's the other voice, that's vaguely American. OK. I got the number for Warner Brothers and dialed up and they answered, Hi, Warner Brothers. <laughs> 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 I took a breath and I told them my name and I said I was a publisher and author in the UK... I wondered if I could speak to Kevin Costner. They said, hang on a moment. <laughs> it was a cartoon character. It was, absolutely. It was from the Flintstones. <laughs> well, oh my word, I'm thinking, what am I going to say if I actually do get through? Well, heart pounding, I waited. Then another click and another voice. Hello, production. <laughs> So I take another deep breath and I told them who I was and I wondered if I could speak to Kevin Costner. I'm sorry, he's on location. <laughs> It's Ray Winston. It's it not is, Ray Winston. Ray Win- He's from New York, this guy. <laughs> Ray Winston in... Who's the really tough guy in Tintin? Yes, there you go. I'm really sorry. He's... he's <laughs> all right, I'll just... He's on location at the moment. Could you call back? Oh, yeah, OK. Oh, thanks very much. I put the phone down and, to be honest, a bit of a relief... 
slightly disappointed, but mainly relief. Now, this time of year, and at this time, there was a DJ on local radio around these parts where I was living back then, and his pitch was doing phone scams on people. Quite funny, actually, and I thought to promote my book, well, I had an idea. I got my friend to write in to this particular DJ and tell him that her friend, that's me, had phoned Kevin Costner, which was true, about her book and was expecting him to call back any minute, which wasn't really true, and that she thought it would be a really good phone scam to ring and pretend to be Kevin. Uh-huh. Ah. Well, a week or so later, after the letter had gone in, I had a phone call and my friend was with me and she answered it and I heard her say, Oh, yes, she's here. I'll just get her for you. She was waving her hand at me and mouthing, It's them. They say they're Warner Brothers UK. Ah, well, I went on the phone and sure enough, the girl on the other end said she was from Warner Brothers UK and that they had Kevin Costner on the line. OMG, I said loudly. Not that you said that back in those days. I put on a wobbly voice. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm... <laughs> Well, I then spent five minutes pretending that I thought the guy on the end of the line was Kevin Costner when all along I knew it was this DJ. Mind you, he had a very good accent. <laughs> we can all do accents. You know? <laughs> Quite clever, really. And if I had not known that we had engineered all this, I could have believed that it was actually him. So I told him all about my book and uh, said, if he ever came to Liverpool, I would make him a pan of scouse. And he asked me what I was talking about, and I said, it's a Liverpool version of Irish stew, and that's why Liverpudlians are called scousers as a nickname. And he thought that was hilarious, and so the conversation went on from there. Anyway, at the end of it all, he reverted to his own voice and said, <laughs> actually, it's not Kevin Costner, it's Bobby Jazzy Jazz Johnson. Actually, I just made that name up. Yeah, so that's obviously. the name, that's a DJ <laughs> yeah. name. Because all DJs have that kind of name. I allowed myself a brief moment of silence and he said, hello. And I said, you complete and utter... And I then apologised for using bad language. And we ended up having a laugh and I said, of course they could use it on his phone scam slot. And then we said goodbye. Well, Father Simon, the scam went to the top of the listener's favourite scams list. And my book was taken by WH Smith as a result and was a bestseller in Milton Keynes, of all places. Wow. Oh, she's not quite sure why it's a bestseller in Milton Keynes. So for the forgiveness, I need it for scamming the scammer. Yes, scamming the DJ and his listeners. And most of all, forgiveness for my then 14-year-old foster daughter. At the time, I had to go into school and admit that, yes, that mad woman on the end of the phone was actually her foster mum. The scam kept being voted top and they played it several times more over the coming year. And even my hairdresser was talking about it to her staff when she was washing my hair and they were laughing. I said, well, that was me. How hilarious. Well, sorry, Mr DJ Bobby Jazzy Jazz Johnson, who is still broadcasting, I understand. And if he did know it was a reverse scam, he never said anything. And my foster daughter did, in the end, get some respect from her schoolmates. So please forgive me, everybody, and Mr Costner. I am here if you're interested in making a film of my book. Well, uh, you would have thought Kevin Costner might have called back after all that because she did show a particular bit of effort and she thought of Braveheart first of all. But anyway, she scammed the scamming DJ and uh, she plugged her book. It got taken by Smith's number one in Milton Keynes. What do you think, Sister Bobby? Then? Well, it's a kind of win-win, lose-win thing because she won with the marketing, great marketing. Also, the radio station didn't lose because of that because they got a great scam phone call, even if she did set it up. That worked perfectly. The daughter... Well, she was momentarily mortified, but of course, as we all get, we all think our parents are crazy, and then we grow up and we think, actually, they were absolutely brilliant. So I said, win, win, lose, win, everyone wins, you're absolutely forgiven. What a great idea. Uh, she w it was very, very <laughs> smart of her to, to actually set up the scam in the first place. Yes, it was. Uh, I, I think I know who that DJ was. And, uh, well, it was Bobby Jazzy Jazz Jazzy, Johnson. Jazzy Jeff, yes. Um, uh, I am going to definitely forgive here. Um, what a great amount of initiative to show. And who, who'd have ever thought... That this was the way to get your your book uh, loads of decent PR. Well done. Um, uh, and uh, I, yes, I I, I I wish I'd thought of that myself as, as some way of Have you getting got a book out. No, uh, but if I did, then then this would very much be the route that I would go rather than going to all the hassle of trying to phone Kevin Costner and whichever ridiculously sounding people they have answering the phones of Warner Brothers. Uh, so for I that, thought it wasn't is, bad. Yeah, um, uh, I'm going to say forgiven just because of that. Just for the actual calling Warner Brothers. I just love the yes. idea of the fact you really like a star, so you're just going to ring them yeah, up. Yeah, say what ring happens. Them up. Yeah. Different times. 
So Louise sends in tonight's tale. Thank you very much, D. Louise. Father Simon, for forgiving for you. I realise when you hear of my actions, you may think that forgiveness isn't possible, but I'm desperately pinning my hopes on you forgiving me. Not because I deserve it, but because I'm utterly, utterly remorseful and ashamed. My confession goes back to the autumn of 1993. I just started secondary school, and my older brother, Stuart, and I caught the same bus home as his school was just down the road from mine. Every night at 4.30pm, we get home, let ourselves in as our parents were at work, got changed, did our homework and then met up with each other on the settee just in time for neighbours to start. This is a very 90s kind of confession. The kettle was never cold in our house and Stuart brewed up constantly. I was and still am a non-tea drinker. You know, those weird adults that don't drink hot drinks and are treated like lepers by the tea drinking <laughs> society and penalised on staff training days and courses as there's never a cold drink substitute provided. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. Every Ooh. afternoon during Neighbours, <laughs> Stuart would enjoy his well-earned brew as it had been at least ten minutes since he had his last one. Now, anyway, it's getting colder and one night my mum comes home from work proudly holding something that looks odd. What's that? I said suspiciously. It's a slow cooker. You mm. put all your meat and veg in it at the beginning of the day, switch it on, cook slowly throughout the day, and when your dad and I come home from work, we can all have lovely warm stews and casseroles without any cooking. Blah, I hate casseroles. I'm not eating anything <laughs> like that. I'd rather go hungry, I exclaimed, in that obnoxious way a cocky 11-year-old can sometimes do. It's good food, Lou. Healthy goes a long way. Money is tight for everyone these days. My mother just adopted this patronising tone. <laughs> yeah. And this will make sure we all have a proper hot meal at night. Mmm. Mm. Stuart grunted something along the lines of, sounds fine, and I just super rolled my eyes. I hated vegetables, I hated beef. In fact, I hated most things. I was super fussy. And although I was a loving and caring girl, really, I was going through a bit of a stage. The next morning, when I came downstairs for breakfast, the slow cooker was on the kitchen side, staring at me. I sneered and lifted up the lid to be met with a bowl of raw meat, raw vegetables and raw gravy. My heart sank, to be honest. This was my worst culinary nightmare. I wanted ham, egg and chips that night. I was not impressed. I went to school as usual, forgot about the casserole that was slowly and sensibly bubbling away at home. That evening when I put the key in the door and... The smell of the casserole hit me. I instantly remembered the horror from the morning. And this is when my first sin occurred. Without a care in the world or a thought for my soul, I unplugged it. <laughs> I'm not sure what I thought would happen. I just knew that it would stop cooking and therefore we wouldn't be able to eat it. Didn't consider the consequences or how I would explain my actions, but in that split second, I ruined dinner. A dinner that my mum had prepared before her long day at work, and I didn't care. I was 11. I sat down to watch Neighbours with Stuart without a care in my selfish head. A few hours later, mum and dad arrived home from work, tired and cold. Mum walked into the kitchen, and then she shouted angrily, "'Who's unplugged the slow cooker?' Stuart and I rushed to the kitchen. What, says my brother Stuart, confused? One of, the, one of you two has unplugged the slow cooker and now dinner is ruined. I haven't got anything else for tonight that doesn't need defrosting, so that's that, all because one of you unplugged it. Oh, bless my soul, says Stuart frantically from the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I think I must have unplugged it when I plugged in the kettle. I'm so sorry, Mum, I just didn't think. Too right you didn't think, says my dad. What's wrong with you, you idiot? <laughs> I'm really sorry, says my brother. I can't believe I did that. This Father Simon is the scene of my second sin. Oh, Stuart, you idiot, I said, smugly <laughs> and primly. You've ruined dinner. We were all really looking forward to that. Not only did I let him take the blame, I rubbed salt into the wound by hamming it up, as I am doing now, <laughs> pretending to be upset, and wrongly portrayed him as the black sheep that night. The air was blue and I skulked off to my room, grinning, probably to go and listen to Let Loose's greatest hits in my room. They didn't have that many, so that wouldn't no. have taken long. I heard my dad say that we would need to get a takeaway that night. A Stuart has ruined dinner! And there's nothing else. They ordered a Chinese. I couldn't believe my luck. I got Stuart into trouble. I didn't have to eat the casserole that was now undercooked and warming up the bin bag in the kitchen. Bobby's not going to like that bit. I got a Chinese out of it and I was now the golden girl as I would never do anything so stupid as to unplug the slow cooker. Two weeks later, the slow cooker is out again. Two weeks later, I did exactly the same thing and unplug it. Two weeks later, Stuart again takes the blame. <clears throat> I believe it was sausage in batter and chips that night that we had instead of the casserole. I did this thing, this bad thing, this rotten thing, three times. In the end, Mum lost interest in the slow cooker, possibly because of Stuart accidentally unplugging it constantly. 
What's wrong with Stuart? The years passed and I'm now 34 with two children of my own. I happily eat casseroles, so I'm still a little iffy over beef stews. What goes around comes around, and the other day my mum popped round holding a large box. We're having a clear out, dear. We wondered if you'd like this now that your children are older and eating solids. I opened the box and there's the slow cooker, the very one that I had switched off and used to ruin loads of dinners and Stuart's sanity. I now use it three times every week, the chill, <laughs> and the children love it. It's with a hopeful heart I seek forgiveness, not from Stuart. He was always practising wrestling moves on me and gave as good as he got. Uh, I love Stuart dearly, but I'm sure he got his own back on me many times over the years. Instead, I seek forgiveness from my parents, my loving and hard-working mum and dad. Back then, I had no idea of the importance of healthy dinners, how hard it was juggling work with family life, and how they couldn't afford to waste money on Chinese and chippies all the time. I'm older and wiser and thoroughly ashamed. Mind you, who doesn't love a Chinese? Lots of love. <laughs> Yours in hope from Louise. I think Bobby's going to take a very, very <laughs> hard line. I feel a sense of moral <laughs> outrage. Bobby Price. Yeah, it was, I was kind of going with it and thinking, mm. well, you're only 11 and you did it once, but you kept on doing it. And that's a kind of very, very mean way. If you didn't get your brother into trouble each time, you could kind of go, your mum and dad should have put a sticker on it, should have said, don't unplug this. But you really did let your brother into it. And also, what a lovely guy. Oh, it must have been me. I'm really sorry. Every time he got the blame. And What's he never ever said, he never ever said, I think Louise might be doing this on purpose. And I say it's a very mean way of your parents just to get um, off, on, mean on your parents just to get um, chips and Chinese. And also the slowest cooker on record, I reckon. Uh, yeah. You are not forgiven. I see, I would, I would have thought that that, you know, because if you think, okay, you've done a very bad thing, hey, let's have a feast, then clearly you're, gonna, you're sending the message out that if you do this again, hey, we're going to have another feast. Let's see what the novice makes of it. You see, I just did my calculations there, Bobby, and slow, because we've already had eight hours in. You do it at eight o'clock in the morning, let's say, when you get out of the house. We come back for neighbours about four, so that's still eight hours. So actually, uh, a slow cooker, you could have cooked most things. I don't know whether they actually looked at it and thought, oh, that's nowhere near, or we, or we could have finished it off in the oven or something like that. But to turn it off, yeah. um, I think... But there again, Lou has been horrid. Never mind horrid Henry, or never mind <laughs> bit stupid Stu, because he definitely was, um, three times, I mean, really. Mm. Uh, we don't know what's happened to him, do we now? No. Um, probably in therapy. But uh, on this occasion, horrid Lou, rather surprisingly, I'm not going to forgive you. You see, the parents have got... The parents... Like yeah, you say, the it's pa the parents' fault. <laughs> the parents, obviously. <laughs> Go yes. ahead. Well, I'm going to forgive uh, Lou for two reasons. One is that in all the years we've been doing confessions, what always happens is the person who's giving the confession always makes everyone else in the story sound bad. And yet in this story, Lou has, has gone out of her way to say, I was the one who's the petulant 11-year-old and, and everyone else was super nice about it, including my brother. Um, and so for that reason, I, I'd like to forgive. But I'd also like to forgive because I am also one of those people who doesn't drink that much tea. And what is it with you people constantly having... You're constantly having tea all the time and saying, oh, Matt, you're not making any... No, I'm not making tea because I'm not drinking. You people drink tea all the time. So uh, for that reason, I am going to forgive. Do you not like tea then, Matt? I'm not... Uh, it's I, been a I long day. I tea. <laughs> OK, but, but... You know... Well, they were this week's tales. Did you forgive anyone? I suspect not. Anyway, yours, please. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. Plus, if you, uh, if you have time and you're online and you fancy just a quick recce over what we've done this week, it's the least you can do, really. Uh, Rob Brydon was here on Monday. This is all on the iPlayer, by the way. Uh, we had a Tunes Day on Tuesday. That was pretty good. Top comedian Bill Bailey came out of the show uh, uh, on Wednesday making everybody smile and look at the world of limbo in a slightly different way. And Nige on Thursday with his black bean and chipotle chipotle chowder. The recipe can be found on my Radio 2 page. Thank you very much indeed for listening. And if you get to this point and you'd like to tweet me something just to prove that you got to this point, I'm now going to tell you some words which my producer is going to say in my ears and that's going to be the clue that lets me know that you got to the end. Wibble, wobble, wibble are the inspiring words. So that's three words. It's a three-word confessioner that you have to send in. Wibble, wobble, wibble or wobble, wibble, wobble. Wibble, wobble, wibble. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs>